Although he's usually credited with developing the theory of evolution, it's more accurate to say that Charles Darwin introduced the theory of natural selection, the mechanism for evolution, in 1859. More than 20 years before, Darwin had set sail aboard the HMS Beagle to study the flora and fauna of South America, despite the fact that he was perpetually seasick. Oh my. <laughs> Well into the five-year study, Darwin reached the Galapagos Islands. The natural history of this archipelago is very remarkable. It seems to be a little world within itself. The greater number of its inhabitants, both vegetable and animal, being found nowhere else. Among the animals Darwin found were lots of birds, finches to be precise. He collected 13 varieties, all very much alike, except for the size and shape of their beaks. I came to the conclusion that all the finches were descended from one species. Over a long period of time, the birds' beaks had changed. Each was adapted to the kind of food available in their local area. Seed eaters' beaks were different from insect eaters' beaks and so on. From this and other observations, Darwin developed the theory of natural selection. Certain conditions must be met for natural selection to occur. There must be a population of things that can make copies of themselves. The copying process must be imperfect. And the copying errors must lead to differences in the ability of the offspring to survive and make copies of themselves. These copying errors may result in the offspring being better suited to their environment. Or perhaps not. But if the changed offspring are better able to survive, then that change will likely endure and spread throughout the population over generations. For example, there is a species of moth, Biston betularia, but hardly anyone calls them that, that ranges in color from light to dark. A population of them lived in a birch forest. Light-colored moths blended with the tree bark, but darker ones stood out against the white birch bark. Birds ate more dark moths because they were easier to spot, leaving mostly light-colored moths to reproduce. Then came the Industrial Revolution, and with it, air pollution. The white birch bark turned sooty gray. Now the pale moths were more visible to birds, and the darker ones were camouflaged. Oh, no. Birds began eating more pale-colored moths. In less than 100 years, the population of moths shifted from mostly pale to mostly dark. In this example, it pays to be different. When natural selection favors a single trait, such as color, it's called directional selection. Remember the Galapagos finches? During droughts, birds with strong, large, or very long bills were better equipped to survive. Those with average, medium bills were out of luck. This is an example of disruptive selection. It pays to be a survivor with the right equipment. But sometimes it pays to be average. The third distinct type of natural selection is called stabilizing selection, and it favors individuals that are the most like everyone else. Over time, the most common traits are favored, and the extreme ones are reduced or even eliminated. Today, the scientific evidence for evolution and natural selection underscores the complexity and beauty of biological design. <laughs>